for just a moment. And, you know, to reveal something means you uncover it. And the mysteries that was revealed to the Apostle Paul by the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, a mystery is something somebody knows, but it's kept secret, it's hidden, it's covered up somehow. And what the stressing here is that what the Apostle Paul wrote for us in this dispensation was something that was kept secret until it was uncovered. And Jesus Christ uncovered it to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul preached it and he wrote it down. And I've been done lessons along this line now for a while and may continue to. I don't know about that. But uh, in John chapter 6, I want to point out that in verse 63, it says, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That's Jesus Christ speaking. The words he speaks are the spirit. And this Bible, all of it, is the manifestation of the spirit of Almighty God. It's what he wants us to know. It's what he would have us to know. And it's what he would have us to believe and have faith in and have, can put our trust in. Because he's not speaking to anybody any other way nowadays. There's no prophecies being made. He's not waking anybody up in the middle of the night and talking to them or anything of that sort. But I want you to go over to 1 Corinthians, if you will, chapter 2. And <laughs> I want to read verse 7. Where Paul's talking about preaching the cross and Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's what he preached. He didn't want to know anything. He wasn't worried about preaching anything else. Why would you? You ever understand the Apostle Paul's position? You understand mine and yours? We're living in a dispensation here that without Paul's epistles, nobody would know anything about or care anything about. It wouldn't have nothing to do with the Old Testament and the Hebrew epistles and so forth we're just being a, being a blank it'd be like being in a cell somewhere not knowing anything but we have God's word to us about something he says here in verse 7 but we and the we would be him and Sothenes <laughs> so he said, they address this letter We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. It's been kept a secret. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So this hidden wisdom of God that he ordained before the world. Before the world was. God ordered this. He ordained it. He, he said, yeah, this is what we're going to do. Now, he said, which none of the princes of this world knew. Well, who are the princes of this world? It would be people in charge, wouldn't it? It would be people running things or people who were the hierarchy of something. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Well, why would you love God? Why would you love God today if he didn't send you his word upon something? And he says, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, capital S, or the spirit, capital S, searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. 
now. Well, then, would God have you to know all things? Would he? Do you, do you know all things? Well, no, I don't know all things, but is all things written that I need to know? Yes. All that God would have me to know is written in his word. I don't know them all. And it wouldn't do me any good to know them all, probably. I want to know what the Lord wants me to know, though, and I hope you do, too. Now, I want you to go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And um, you might hold there for just a moment. And I, I hold there because I want to come right back, but I want to go to Ephesians, first of all, and read something in chapter 1. Now, y'all might be saying, well, why is he talking about this? We know all this. Well, I don't know whether you know all this or not. And I, you know, I realize that I preach the same thing all the time. And I'm not going to change because I want to make known the good news of Jesus Christ to people. I, If you already know it, praise God and you go tell somebody, will you? I mean, that's, that's, you know. Verse 3 of Ephesians 1 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath, the past tense, blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So what we have is not in this world, it's in Christ. We have it here by faith, by the faith of Christ and by our faith in Him. And he says, according, it's all in accordance with, as he hath chosen us in him. He chose us in Christ. He didn't choose you because of your flesh, because you were ugly or because you were pretty or because you were rich or because you were poor. He chose those who would trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. And, you know, I realized that I went many years of my life but not understanding what it meant to even have a Savior, let alone have one. A Savior from what? I was always told oh, he'd save you from wanting to be a sinner. I found that not to be true. It was never explained to me that he was their sacrifice. Blood had to be shed. The only thing that would cover sin out of God's sight was innocent blood to cover the guilty blood. I didn't know that. So is it Am I, was I the only person in the world that didn't understand that? I don't know. I just know I didn't. Was I ignoring it? Was it preached and I didn't hear it? <coughs> I don't ever remember until after I learned, heard people preaching the Word of God rightly divided that I didn't know any such thing. I just thought that Jesus Christ died so that if I would accept Him into my heart that I would then not want to sin anymore and I'd live this life you know, without sin. And now I wouldn't want to sin. He'd take my desire to sin away and all this kind of stuff. In other words, I didn't know who the real Savior was. Well, why is that? Because the Word of God gets hidden by Satan. The truth of the Word of God is hidden by Satan all the time by people saying they're teaching out of this Bible, or some phony Bible for that matter, but that's what they're doing. Paul says in verse 3 of chapter 4 of Second Corinthians, I didn't go read the other Ephesians thing, but I'll get to it. But if our gospel, do we have some good news? What is this good news? That's what I'm aiming to get at here. What's the good news? Isn't it good news that you have a Savior? That means He was your sacrifice. It means God accepted it. God is pleased with it. He smelled a sweet-smelling savor. He don't see you in your sin anymore, even if you're still lost. He don't see you in your sin. But He don't see you ever leaving hell unless you'll trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's a substitute for you. 
That had to be. God can't accept you any other way except in Jesus Christ. And if you're one who will trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, then He knew it and He chose you before the foundation of this world was ever laid. People don't understand. They have God on some kind of pedestal condemning these and praising these and all this kind of thing all the time. It's not like that at all. This was something that was done in Christ before the foundation of the world. God already knew that Jesus Christ was going to die to reconcile him to the whole world. Then it was to be preached. The Holy Ghost wrote this Bible. He inspired it to be written and it was to be preached to people that God knew would trust in him and say, well, that sounds like predestination. No, it's not predestination. God can't make you trust in Jesus Christ. He can't make you believe him. I can't do it, and any other preacher can't do it. The word of God must convince people that they only can trust in Jesus Christ. God fixed one way for people to be saved. One way. And it's to trust in Jesus Christ. Our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. In other words, if people will open their eyes, get the blindness away from their eyes, shut Satan out and all his ministers out and listen to the word of God, they can see the truth about it all and come to the realization the only thing they can do is quit trusting their flesh and quit trusting this organization or that organization or this man or that man over there and trust in Jesus Christ, trust the Word of God that this is true. <coughs> it says, in whom? The lost. The God, little g, of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. If their minds weren't blinded, would they believe? Yes, they would. But as I've experienced in my life, my mind was blinded. Even hearing the truth, my mind was blinded. I couldn't, I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it to the point to where I would lay aside my pride, my boastful self, and say, the problem is I'm lost. Less the light, the knowledge, that's what light is, of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. I can't say follow me. I can't say don't follow me. I can't say anything. I ain't nothing. I'm a human being. I'm a bunch of flesh. I'm a bunch of sinful flesh. But praise God by mind got lighted. It received the light finally one night and it says and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Why would we bother teaching? Why did Paul preach? He preached for Jesus Christ's sake. He didn't preach for his sake. He became a poor man. He became a jailbird. He became somebody that got tied to a post and beat. He wasn't making any gain for the flesh. And he says here, Why? For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Where's the darkness? We're surrounded with it. Does this light shine into this darkness? You and I, are our physical bodies are living in. You say, oh no, the sun's out and it's bright and whatever. We have 14 different news stations on television now. We're well informed about everything. Yeah, we're well informed about everything that keeps our mind occupied except this Word of God. And I hope that you and I have this information, but does the dark, darkened world around us have it? No, I'm afraid they don't. Give the light has shined in our hearts, in our hearts, in our mind, our soul to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Can you see the glory of God? 
We can only see it in this word. This thing that's been uncovered. Jesus Christ uncovered this. It was known. Did God know it before the foundation of the world? Is it, should I use the word, handed at? <coughs> Do we get a glimpse of this light? Has God dealt with people up until the time of Christ and even after Christ, all the way to the cross? Did we have a, was there a hint of all of this? Yes. He kept showing people. He took the blood sacrifice. He took the blood, takes the blood sacrifice. Their Redeemer was promised to come. The Reconciler was going to come and so forth. And yet, they didn't know that Redeemer and that Reconciler. They thought it was a physical redemption. They didn't know it was something that only God could do and that only pure blood could once and for all be all the sacrifice God would ever need again. This is a wondrous, glorious message. It outshines, it outdoes anything anybody else can dream up or whatever. This is what the Bible says. And it says we have this treasure, this precious knowledge in the earthen vessels, our flesh, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. God fixed it so no man can ever take any credit. You can't take credit for anybody else's salvation. You can't take credit for yours. Jesus Christ gets all the credit. He gets all the glory. That's what that amounts to. And uh, while we're right here, before I go back to Ephesians again, go back to Galatians chapter 1. And this is all, I hope, scriptures that you're all very familiar with. Here, Paul says in verse 11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was it taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ revealed something to the Apostle Paul. What was it? What he revealed was that when he died, he was the sacrifice. He was the substitute for all of mankind. And that God accepted it. And that God forgave and destroyed sin. And that's what Paul had revealed to him. And he writes this. In all 13 of his epistles, this is written. That God forgave sin. It wasn't just put in remission as it was for Israelites and those under the new covenant that Jesus Christ had taught and the twelve taught for Israel's little flock and so forth. No, this is something that was just revealed to make known to you and me in the dispensation of grace that has been given to mankind. Because during this dispensation, it don't matter who you are. It don't matter what shade your skin is. It don't matter if you're male or female. It don't matter if you're the cleanest person in the world or the dirtiest person in the world. Jesus Christ died for you and all your sin has been forgiven if you just trust Him. And people would immediately want to say, well, are you just saying people can live however they want to? I'll say this about it. People do live however they want to. But if you understand the precious gift that's been given, I would contend that it would make you want to live for the Lord to make Him known because He bought eternal life for you. Eternal life. Living forever. As a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I don't think you can find a better plan than that. You can buy an insurance plan here on this life, but it only means something to you as long as you're alive. You can accept God's plan and it's forever. That's a big difference. Forever is not just a long, long time. It's eternal. There's no time involved in it. Now, he says here, verse 15, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace. You know, he says in another place, He was as one born out of due time. Something was due 
time was up. And God was pleased then for his son to be a sacrifice at this time, at the point of time. He called me by his grace, he says, to reveal, to make known, to uncover the mystery, to uncover the truth that's always been there, but it wasn't known till now, to reveal his son in me, in Paul, that I might preach him among the heathen immediately. I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, so on and so forth. Why wouldn't, why did he, he didn't need to go up there. Why would he go ask them if Jesus Christ spoke to him? He had the word of God. Jesus Christ, his son, revealed this to him, he says. He didn't need to go to any man to ask any questions about it. And he always says he didn't. He, he recounts that when he went to Jerusalem, even 14 years later, they, whatever they said didn't mean anything to him. didn't matter at all. They added nothing to him, he said. Now I want you to go back to Ephesians again in chapter uh, 6 for a moment. Now I want you to notice Paul's prayer. The Apostle Paul prayed. I hope you all pray. I find myself praying a lot. You know why? Because my old flesh is weak and say, oh, you're praying to not, and I ain't praying to not sin. I ain't worried about that. I'm praying to God most all the time about what? About this message getting out. And I hope you do too because that's what Paul's prayer is about. He prayed, we'll go back to his prayer in a, chapter 3 in a moment, but here he mentions prayer. He wants you to pray as I would want you to pray for me or I would pray for you. He says here after talking about <clears throat> taking a stand for the truth is the context. But he says in the end, his last thing he says about prayer. In verse 18, after he talks about the whole uh, armor of God that we are to have, that we can only have through the Word of God. And he says in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. What's the Spirit? It's the Word of God. Will you pray in accord, in accordance with the Word of God? You know, people usually talk about praying. They want you to pray for the sick. Well, it's okay. Pray for the sick. You can pray whatever you want to about them because we're supposed to pray about anything that we're concerned about. Philippians chapter 3 or 4, I'm sorry. Aren't we supposed to pray about everything? Or anything? Absolutely. I'm not talking about putting on a show of me standing up here making some kind of long prayer about something. That might not be from my heart. And I believe when you pray or I pray, it should be from really the depths of our heart and our soul. What is it we really desire? What are we talking to God about? And if you're saved, you can talk to Him. But the answer is in this Bible. And He says... And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all saints. So there's what we're to pray for. Then he says, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. The unveiling, the, un the revealing, the making known of the gospel. That's what needs to be made known. And that's what he wanted people to pray for him about. He didn't ask them to pray for that he'd not get shipwrecked again or he'd not get thrown in jail and get had a nine tails used on him or anything or that he'd have to flee for his life from here or there. He never asked nobody to pray about that, did he? He wanted them to pray that he'd be able to open his mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel, what had been revealed to him 
by Jesus Christ. Now let's go back to Ephesians 3. The other prayer, he, or, I'm sorry, chapter 1, not 3. Can't read my own notes. Paul says here, after talking about the fact that these people had trusted once and for all Jesus Christ as their Savior, as their sacrifice. And they were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Word of God, how they knew it. So he says, Wherefore, in verse 15, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints. What was their faith in the Lord Jesus about? Was he going to make them rich? Was he going to make them healthy? Or do they have eternal life in him? He says, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, I don't know how people get the idea that God and Jesus Christ are the same person. I would agree that Jesus Christ is God, but He ain't God the Father. I know Jesus Christ is God our Savior, but I know the Father is God our Savior, and I know they're a trinity, and so on and so forth. But I'm not a part of the people who want to say, Jesus is God. It took God the Father to raise him up from the dead because, you see, he died. If he didn't die, then you wouldn't have sacrifice. If he hadn't shed his blood, which is how the flesh lives, you wouldn't have sacrifice. He says he's praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. You have the, There's something been revealed. It's been made known. It's, expl it's an explanation of why we're here and how we can be saved, how we have eternal life in Jesus Christ. And he says, and the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know the hope of his calling. I mean, they, these people have believed upon Jesus Christ. They've trusted him as their Savior. No one, they, they, it's not connected with Israel. It's not connected with other messages from God ever. It has to do with this one that Jesus Christ revealed to the Apostle Paul. He says... <coughs> What is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? And he explains that, which he wrought in Christ. You understand, your sin could never be forgiven by anything you do. It had to do, it only has to do with what God did because of what Jesus Christ did. It's not got anything to do with what you do about it. It's got to do with when you quit doing anything about it and you will trust in what he did. You'll trust in this word, this revealed word of God that came through Jesus Christ to this man, our apostle Paul. He says, according to the working of his mighty power, and only God had the power to do this. Say so, you don't believe in God? I just suggest you look at nature. Look at our world. Look at the vastness of the universes. Look at all of it. And tell me there ain't a God. And since I believe there is, then I believe the Bible too. I believe this is God's Word. This is what has been revealed to us. And I'll back up a moment. If we didn't have this revelation, we would, you understand, we wouldn't believe the Bible and nobody else. You know, you could start naming denominations who want to say they're keeping the law to be saved or they're 
repenting and getting baptized to be saved, and they're trying to uh, make up a good covenant they can make between themselves and God and so on and so forth. They wouldn't even be doing that if the Apostle Paul had not got this revelation from Jesus Christ because they would have no explanation as to why we're here. None at all. They would think this book without Paul's epistles in it was a fantastic old story somebody wrote. But the fact that God revealed mysteries through Jesus Christ under the Apostle Paul should make everyone know this is God's Word. This is what He wants us to know. God honors faith because this is an age in which faith in Jesus Christ is the only way you can be saved. which he wrought in Christ with mighty power when he raised him from the dead. It took a mighty power to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. And it took a mighty, awesome, merciful God Almighty to even put your sin and mine and all the world upon his Son. And it took a mighty, awesome, and powerful God to forgive and destroy it. Can you imagine that God could see this world? Let's just look at the condition it's in right now. He could see it. He has foreknowledge. He could see it. And yet he forgave all the sin of all the world in order that he could raise his son Jesus Christ up from the dead rightly and justly knowing it was going to make him reconciled unto you and all the rest of the world. I mean, I don't have to consider the rest of the world. I can simply look at myself and say what a wonderful God and a wonderful Savior there God and Jesus Christ are that they would do such a thing for me. Set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. After he'd had all... he'd. His flesh had been covered with what I am and what you are and what the world is. But he set him there far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that world is, which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. We, his body, we are the assembly of people, of humankind, who trust in Jesus Christ. It's not because you're better than me. It ain't because, if possible, you'd be worse than me. It's because of God's love and his mercy that he would send his son be because his son was the only sacrifice that could satisfy where he could forgive the sin, destroy the sin, and so forth. Now, I want you to turn over to uh, go to Colossians chapter 1. Yeah. We've been translated, it says. Have you ever trusted? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? I mean, I know so many people, as I was. The reason I was convicted, convinced I should try to preach the gospel back in uh, 1988. was that I fear that so many people had been duped as I had. 
Not that I knew much or anything like that, but I thought, I had something to tell people. What was it? The Lord saved me. That's what I had to tell people. I mean, I went through some motions when I was 12 years old and I went to the altar of prayer and I went through and did everything that was expected of me and so forth and they told me I was saved. And if I'd have died any time between three or four years after that probably, I wouldn't even say I was accountable when I was 12 years old. You know why? I didn't know any truth. That's about that. I didn't know any truth. I knew my mama and daddy wanted me to do this and that. And I thought, I knew how important it was to them for them to be able to say, well, Jack got saved. Yeah, right. And I never was really convinced of how sinful I was until I got a little older and I, I found out what my nature really was. I even, I'd had a terrible temper. Of course, now I'm sweet and kind. But anyway. But I had a terrible temper when I was a child. And uh, I got straightened out about that. But by the time I got 15, 16 years old, a lot of other things happened and I began to realize just how mean and honorary I really was, you know. And now I knew I wasn't saved, as they say. Well, it wasn't long until I gave up on all that. We were allowed to quit going to church when we were 16 if, when we, if, we, if that's what we chose, and sure enough, I quit. Never went back. And that's probably the best decision I ever made in my life was to quit going to church. Modify the win. Got duped further into it. Got tr further tricked into believing I could live like they expected me. Or I could pretend to be accepted real well on Sunday morning. I even tried going to church one time to the neighborhood church where I lived and uh, they wanted to call me Brother Lockhart. And I couldn't stand it. Now you can call me that now. Don't bother me. You're my brother. And I hope you are. But why, why was I couldn't stand that? I wanted to go there. I wanted to take my kids to learn something. But I couldn't do it. I thought Every time somebody said that to me, I felt like the worst hypocrite in the world. But I didn't believe what they were, I didn't believe what they were teaching. So quit that. Anyway. Verse 21 here says, And you, that were sometime alienated in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. I wish I'd have knew these verses back then. I truly do. I, I, I can't blame anybody but me. Don't misunderstand me. But I didn't know, I wouldn't have known such verses were in the Bible. I didn't know anything about what the Apostle Paul wrote. It had never been revealed unto me. And oh yeah, we were told to go over here to Romans 10 and learn and quote this verse and that sort of thing, you know. But to see the context of it all or the fact that he was the Apostle of the Gentiles, <coughs> no, not a word. It's kept hidden. Why, that has to be of the devil. Don't you realize what we read back there in Second Corinthians 4? Who else blinds the minds of people? Satan. He does it. You say, well, they're good people. Yeah, I know they're good people. Even my own dad used to say, hell's full of good people who had good intentions and lived a good moral life. But he'd say they never got saved. And churches are full of people like that. They never got saved. They just decided to be good, go to church and act good. 
Maybe they were good. Maybe they'd been taught to live good and righteous and honest lives. And fooled into believing that that's why people went to heaven. Beloved, that's not why people go to heaven. People go to heaven because of what Jesus Christ did and you don't go unless you accept what he did to have been for you. It comes down to that. Yet now hath he reconciled and I was an enemy by my wicked works. You say, well, what kind of wickedness did you do? Well, of course that's what you want to know. Well, I didn't do much, much different than most people. But I knew I didn't live by the standard churches taught. So I was separated in my mind by wicked works, not understanding that God was reconciled unto me through what Jesus Christ did as offered himself up as the sacrifice for me. And he says he did it in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Can you get better than that? Can you be holy and unblameable and unreprovable in the sight of God? Only through the body of his flesh through death is the only way you can be presented that way. He had to die in your place. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, that'd be like you, because you've trusted Christ and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. That's the hope of the gospel is that, and the confidence in the gospel is that you've traced your faith, your trust in what Jesus Christ did to have settled it with God for you. And God then is able to save you for the sake of his son, not for the sake of your flesh. And he says, Be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Whereof I, Paul, was made a minister. And I'll guarantee you, Paul was made a minister to everybody that's ever heard it or ever going to. Because that's what he was given this message for. And he says, Who now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. So that's what real church, you know, people say, well, and I do it like everybody else. If I tell my wife where I'm going, I say I'm going down to the church. Do I realize the church ain't here? Yeah, I do. But I realize she knows where I'm going if I say that. Too. Church is here this morning. Are you part of the body of Christ? This church? His assembly of people who trust in Him. Whereof I am made a minister, he says, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the Word of God. And that's, you know, people like to say, well, you know, Peter and John, they wrote some really good things, and they did. It's the Word of God, what they wrote. It's just not to you. James and Jude wrote really good things too. But it ain't to you. I reckon Luke wrote the book of Luke. And Luke wrote the book of Acts. And he knows what the Apostle Paul, he knew what the Apostle Paul, God, he knew about the Revelation, didn't he? He knew what had been revealed to the Apostle Paul. He says, even the mystery. Thing that had been kept hidden. Which has been hid from ages and from generations, he says. But now, but now, is made known to his saints. Those who believe it, who trust in it. To whom God would make known. What is the riches of the glory of this mystery amongst, among the Gentiles? which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, and you in Him. You're at one with Christ if you trust in Him. And God knew it before the foundation of the world. He knew who would trust in Jesus Christ. And 
people think, well, then he makes everybody get saved. No, he don't. The word's got to go out. It's got to be preached. That's why Paul prayed that he would be able to make this known. That's why I hope you pray for me and I'll pray for you. I hope we all pray that this word gets uh, gets revealed, gets uncovered, be made known. That's what we desire. A lot of people want to say, yeah, let's find the last person so we can rapture will happen. We can get out of here. I'm not concerned about that. I don't care if the rapture don't happen for another hundred years. That, that's not for me to say, not for me to know. Our job, as long as we're here, is to make this message come to light. And we have to get Satan's darkness and his covering it up out of the way. And we can't throw a bomb on anybody. We can't do anything of the sort. All we can do is keep preaching it, talking to people, saying anything about it that we can. Go over to... Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. I don't remember why I've got this note, but we'll go there anyway. Paul just mentions here, and I might say, he's talking to Timothy, the preacher, but he says in verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me his prisoner, but be thou partakers of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Talking about God, who hath, past tense, saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. It's a gift. People don't like to accept gifts. They like to exchange gifts. They don't want to accept one. Pride. It's called human pride. They don't want to accept a gift. That's why churches can succeed. Get people to put on a little show, walk in the aisle, getting baptized, reciting a prayer, whatever it is they want people to do, and that makes that person proud. They did it. God won't honor it. He honors people trusting, trusting, having trusted forever what his son did and what he did through the righteousness of what Jesus Christ did. And he says, but he's now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. It's made known. Well, I know what that appearing is then. I compare it with the other things I've read and talked about this morning. The appearing is when he revealed to the Apostle Paul that he could be saved because of what the cross had accomplished. What had it accomplished? The destruction of sin was gone. It wasn't a problem between God and man anymore. He would reconcile all of mankind. Hmm. Who hath abolished death, it says, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. If you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have eternal life. You're never going to die. Yeah, your old flesh is going to go back to dust or wherever it, whatever it came from. Whatever you've eaten, whatever's caused you to grow, overgrow, whatever we do, it's going to go back to dust. God's not interested in saving flesh. He's interested in saving your soul for all eternity. According to Second Corinthians five and Ephesians three or Philippians three, we have a new body, fashioned like unto that of the glorious body of the Lord Jesus Christ he had in resurrection. I know. 
You can't imagine that. I can't either. But I believe the Word of God, and I hope that you do. I thank you all for your time and attention this morning. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.